Today, we are taking a look at the truth of the forbidden tree banned from the Bible. This is a Gnostic text called On the Origin of the World that was banned by the church, and it describes a completely different account of creation. And particularly today, we're looking at the creation of the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. And we're going to say see that its function is completely different than what we're told in the Bible, that it has to do with a trap and the limitation of our true selves and what humanity really is. It's going to be really good. There's a lot of of interesting information that we're taking a look. We're also looking at the secret book of John as well, um, which has a very interesting uh, uh, description of the tree of life, which um, is uh, quite dark indeed. So it's going to be very good, a lot to talk about, a lot of interesting information to go over, and we're going to get right into it. But as always, please like and subscribe so that we can get the algorithm to spread this information around. Also, if you enjoy my work, consider supporting on Patreon or becoming a member on YouTube. If you become a member on Patreon at any tier or tier two or higher on YouTube, you get access to members only videos and there's a new one every single week. That's a lot. And let's see, also uh, be aware for of, of there's scammers in the comments. There's people pretending to be me, uh, saying to join my WhatsApp and my Telegram, DMing people on other platforms, whatever. Don't fall for it. It's a scam. That's not me. I don't have a Telegram. I don't have a WhatsApp. I don't have any of those things. Uh, be on the lookout for people out there who don't like what I'm doing, who don't like what we're doing, and they're spreading a lot of misinformation and disinformation about me and our group. So just keep your eyes open. Uh, don't fall for the bullshit. Use your mind. Use logic and reason. All right, my friends. The forbidden truth about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. This is going to be really good. So we're going to jump right into it. And like I said, we're going to start off by taking a look at uh, this book called On the Origin of the World, which we have been reading. So if you uh, haven't been following along, that's okay, but there's a whole playlist on this book uh, on the origin of the world, which is a banned Gnostic text. Now, if you remember last time where we left off, it was with where Yaldabaoth realizes his mistake. Now, what does that mean? So just real quick, quick recap for people who might not be uh, familiar. Within this secret version of Christianity, the, it's a lot different than what you've been told. In the secret version of Christianity, the God of the Bible is actually an evil being named Yaldabaoth, and the God of the Bible is intent on trying to make humanity its slaves. But we are at a point yet uh, in this story where humanity has not been created yet. Yaldabaoth has basically uh, created its different heavens, and it's created uh, its its own angels, which are demons and archons. There's been a war in heaven with the realm of light between the realm of darkness. Uh, basically, it you know when you when you read the Bible, the Bible just starts off with God creating the earth. This has all the different stories that came before that, which is the battle between the realm of of light and darkness and and their interactions and things like this. But anyway, um, we, we get to the point where, where uh, Yaldabaoth realizes that uh, humanity is more powerful than him. And keep in mind, though, that human bodies haven't even been created yet. So we're at a point where human bodies haven't even been created yet. But we're going to get into that, and, and I'll explain this uh, in a minute. On the Origin of the World is a very strange book. So if some of this sounds a little weird at first, don't worry. I'm going to explain it. So... Um, so here we have, it says Eros and Psyche. So it says, out of this first blood, Eros appeared being androgynous. His masculine nature is Himeros because he is fire from the light. His feminine, his feminine nature is that of a soul of blood and is derived from the substance of forethought. So in Gnosticism, we see that these, these beings always have, are always androgynous and have a masculine and feminine aspect. And so um, you have Eros, and it says he is very handsome in his beauty, having more loveliness than all the creatures of chaos. The, and the creatures of chaos are, of course, God and his angels. The God of the Old Testament and his angels are the beings of chaos, according to Gnosticism, because remember, they're all evil beings born of darkness. 
It says, then when all the gods and their angels saw Eros, they became enamored of him. But when he appeared among all of them, he made them inflamed, just as many lamps are kindled from a single lamp and the light shines, but the lamp is not diminished. So also Eros was scattered in all the creatures of chaos, but was not diminished just as Eros appeared out of the midpoint between light and darkness and in the midst of the angels and the people, uh, the intercourse of Eros was consummated. So too, the first sensual pleasure sprouted upon the earth. What does all that mean? It sounds like it means that Eros made everyone horny. It sounds like that Eros uh, came into being, which was, you know, er Eros having to do with love and eroticism and sensual pleasure. So this is where we sort of have the formation of uh, sensual pleasure, love, and eroticism. Because remember, in Gnosticism, a, a lot of the gods and archons and eons represent different structures in the mind. Like you have Sophia that represents wisdom. You have the different archons that might be like wrath or ignorance. Uh, according to a Jungian interpretation, Yaldabaoth would represent either the shadow self or the ego. I think the ego is pretty fitting, but here you have Eros um, being created and basically making everyone horny is essentially what's happening here. And so sensual pleasure uh, sprouted upon the earth. The woman followed the earth and marriage followed the woman and reproduction followed marriage and death followed reproduction. After Eros, the grapevine is sprouted up from the blood and was shed upon the earth. Therefore, those who drank the vine acquired the desire for intercourse. After the grapevine, a fig appeared and a pomegranate tree sprouted up on the earth, together with the rest of the trees according to their kind, their seed deriving from the seed of the authorities and their angels. So, um, essentially what this is saying is that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically talking about you know, if you're taking it from a literal perspective, those who drink from the vine acquired the desire for intercourse. Uh, basically, those who get drunk want to fuck is what it's saying. Um, but, uh, w w you know, we can understand this in a more uh, symbolic form as well with, you know, sort of intoxication. You know, you could you could think of and basically what's happening is you're you're having a lot of sensuality being introduced here. You're having you're having eros and eroticism and love and sensual pleasure and the vine and wine and all this. And it has to do a little bit with um, you know, when 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 one is is drunk, one is is clouded. So sometimes this has to do with uh, having less of a, a spiritual connection and more of a of a sensual connection or giving into sensual pleasure or giving into sensual desire. So that's essentially what's what's happening right now. And uh, it says here that uh, we have the creation of paradise. Um, hold on one moment. I just want to do a search real quick for... Okay, I just wanted to look because, see, it says Eros and Psyche. So Psyche is going to be um, important uh, later because, see, you, you have this dichotomy here of Eros and Psyche, Eros being eroticism, and then Psyche having to do with the soul or mind. So you have uh, heart and mind, body and soul, uh, pleasure and thought, you know, this sort of dichotomy uh, occurring here. So, but now we have the creation of paradise. Now, this is where it gonna, it's going to get really interesting. And uh, like I said, I know that this might seem a little weird, but we're going to see what's going on here. And the creation of paradise is where this starts to get really interesting. So it says, then justice created the beautiful paradise. It is outside the circuit of the moon and the circuit of the sun in the luxuriant earth, which is in the east in the midst of stones. And desire is in the midst of trees since I, they are beautiful and appealing. And the tree of immortal life, as it was revealed by the will of God, is in the north of paradise to give life to the immortal saints who will come out of the fashioned bodies of poverty in the consummation of the age. Okay, so, like I said, I'm, I'm 
I'm going to break this down. On the origin of the world, this particular Gnostic text is a weird one. It jumps around a lot, but what it's talking about right now is the creation of paradise. And in the creation of paradise is the tree of life. And, and what is the tree of life? The tree of life is to give life to the immortal saints who will come out of the fashioned bodies of poverty in the consummation of the age. The fashioned bodies of poverty are the material bodies that Yaldabaoth is going to create. So right now there are no human bodies. Yaldabaoth, the evil creator god, is later going to create material bodies, and within and and these are these are considered um, fashioned bodies of poverty. Why poverty doesn't mean literally poverty like you're poor. Poverty is a lack of something. So these material bodies are 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 uh, described as as in poverty because they are they're not full, they're not complete, they're not perfect. They're they're you know they're very um, sort of primitive you know, compared to a, a, a being of divine light. And that's what we are. We are beings of divine light. So we are beings of divine light in these fashioned, created uh, bodies of poverty. So you see the difference between being an immortal divine being versus a created body of matter. It's a fashioned body of poverty and and so what the tree of life is, is um, this, this idea, uh, symbolically speaking, that those who eventually transcend the material body will be eternal. That, that's what it sim symbolizes. Now, we're always eternal. We're not never not eternal. Eternal is eternal. But this, this sim sim symbolic of partaking of the tree of life. Uh, but let's hold on. It, it gets deeper here. There's a lot to this. So now the color of the tree is like the sun and its branches are beautiful. Its leaves are like those of the cypress. And its fruit is like the clusters of white grapes. It gives it its heights rise up to the heavens and next to it is the tree of knowledge possessing the power of God. Okay. So next to the tree of life, you have the tree of knowledge. And of course, you know, it says that the tree of life uh, reaches up, reaches up to heaven. Of course, this is symbolic for the higher consciousness, higher understanding it being, it being a bridge essentially from the lower world to the higher world. So next to the tree of life is the tree of knowledge, possessing the power of God. It's and remember when they say God, they're not talking about the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is Yaldabaoth, a being of chaos. The God of the Bible is not God. Uh, so when it says it, it possesses the power of God, they're talking about the true eternal uh, light of which we all are. So the tree of knowledge possesses the power of God. It's next to the tree of life. Its glory is like the moon shining forth brilliantly and its branches are beautiful. Its leaves are like fig leaves and its fruit is like good delicious dates. And this tree is in the north of paradise to raise up the souls from the stupor of the demons so that they might come to the tree of life and eat its fruits and condemn the authorities and their angels. So this is what they're saying. They're saying that the tree of life, when one partakes from the tree of life, the purpose is to, how do they say it? Uh, raise up the souls from the stupor of the demons. So the tree of night life is to wake humanity, or I'm sorry, the tree of knowledge, knowledge is to wake humanity up to, from this slumbering state to realize what they are. And then so they can partake from the tree of life. So do you see how you have the tree of life and the tree of knowledge? The tree of knowledge, partaking from the tree of knowledge, is to awaken from the stupor of the demons, which means to realize what one is, because remember, the demons are uh, the archons, the evil creator god and the other rulers, the angels, whatever you want to call them, 
and uh, they represent structures of the mind that one must overcome. So things like wrath and ignorance and, uh, you know, a bunch of other qualities that keep one rooted in a very primitive sort of mind state. So these, these demons are structures of the self that keep one in a lower state of consciousness. So do you see how this is all symbolic? When one eats from the tree of knowledge, they overcome the demons and then thus are able to eat from the tree of life and become immortal. In other words, when one overcomes one's own limitations that are blocking the achievement of a higher consciousness and reaches a higher consciousness, one realizes that they aren't a body, that they are eternal being, and thus that they are immortal from a soul perspective, from an eternal perspective. So Gnosticism is, is inserting this information in there and um, you can see this is completely different from what it says in the Bible. What does it say in the Bible? It says, well, God said that the tree of the, the tree of knowledge will kill you. And then what did the serpent say? The serpent said, no, it's not going to kill you. It's going to make you like God. You will have understanding. And so, um, and, and we're going to see this is actually described later uh, in, in on the origin of the world. We're going to see Yaldabaoth we're 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 gonna we're gonna see that story eventually um, take place. But it says the effect of this tree is described in the holy book as follows: You are the tree of knowledge, which is in paradise, from which the first man ate, which opened his mind so that he loved his female partner and condemned other alien likenesses and loathed them. See, this is what. Um, so, okay, the tree of knowledge, which is in paradise, from which the first man ate and which opened his mind so that he loved his female partner and condemned other alien likenesses and loathed them. In other words, the tree of knowledge gets one to un, uh, be complete and whole. And so loving the one's female partner is symbolic for becoming whole in integrating all aspects of yourself. In our system, we call this the mirror self, but there are various other aspects of the self. Um, in, in Gnostic thought, the female partner is usually epinoia or like uh, awareness. But, but anyway, it, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that eating from the tree of knowledge allows one to unite with uh, with with all, all opposites are united. One, one, one becomes whole and condemned other alien likenesses and loathed them. Basically, all the uh, things of darkness, all the, uh, you know, uh, demonic beings of chaos and the different traps that they have set up to try and keep humanity away from realizing what it actually is. And that is a being of light trapped in a body. Now... Uh, let's, okay. Here, okay. But let's, 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 th there's more to say about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, because I want to show you what it says in the secret book of John, but let's real quick. There's something more important here that we have to move forward a little bit. Because we have to talk about the primordial human, the human that came before human bodies. So it says, But the first psyche loved Eros, who was with her, and poured her blood upon him and upon the earth. Then from that blood, the first rose sprouted upon the earth out of the thorn bush for a joy in the light that was to appear in the bramble. I love that, actually. That's really cool. So you have the love between psyche and Eros. Psyche is soul, psyche is mind, and eros is love and lust and uh, uh, sensual pleasure. So they're very much opposites, but they're in love and united. And so psyche, mind, soul, spirit, and er eroticism, love, sensuality, united, and from the blood that poured down from them upon the earth, 
the first rose sprouted upon the earth out of the thorn bush for a joy in the light that was to appear in the bramble. Uh, I, I, I really like this imagery a lot. It's very, very cool. You see all these opposites appearing here. You have Psyche and Eros, but they come together. And from their coming together, you have also this dichotomy of a thorn bush and a rose, a rose appearing from the thorn bush. You have this thing that is beautiful and pleasurable and fragrant and something that is very, could be very painful as well. And I think we can understand that when we enter into the realm of matter, this imperfect world, it's a world of a rose and a thorn bush. There's a lot of painful moments. There's a lot of beautiful moments. And the painful moments can make the beautiful moments all the more beautiful. And we're, we're in this world that can be hellish and destructive and terrible, but there can also be beautiful moments as well. And this is this idea of the soul or the mind. Um, going into matter, the soul and mind going into matter for love, for eros, for, for physicality and experiencing this, uh, you know, dichotomy of, of beauty and pain. After this beautiful fra fragrant flower sprouted up the earth, uh, according to their kind from the blood of each of the virgins of the daughters of forethought, when they had become enamored of Eros, they poured out their blood upon him and upon the earth. After these things, every herb sprouted up and very bloody, by the way, this is, it, you know, if one were to visualize this, this would be quite, you just have blood just everywhere and uh, plants and, and whatnot sprouting from it. However, of course, you know, this is, of course, symbolic blood being symbolic for, for, for life, life force, life energy, but still it's it's a quite uh quite a different sort of creation story the very very bloody um so after these things every herb sprouted uh every herb sprouted upon the earth according to its kind having the seed of the authorities and their angels and after these things the authorities created from the waters all species of beasts and reptiles and birds according to their kind having the seeds of the authority, authorities and their angels. So the interesting thing about this is that, uh, so the authorities and their angels of, are, of course, the archons. So you have, you know, it's this idea that this realm of matter is is a realm of, it's mixed with darkness. The, the Gnostic idea that this realm of matter is mixed with darkness. Um, but before all these things, when Adam of light appeared on the first day, he remained upon the earth about two days. Okay. So here's if uh, we talked a little bit about this last time, but we have this idea of a primordial human. This primordial human isn't a body. It's a spiritual being. And it's, it's before this, this is not the Adam. This is, this is, this is not Adam and Eve, Adam. This is before, this is the pre Adam. This is meta Adam. This is, this is, uh, you know, the, the first iteration, Adam, the, 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 the spiritual version. And this being is extremely powerful. It's in fact a god. And this is why Yaldabaoth does not like humanity because humanity is more powerful than him. Humanity is more powerful than, than uh, God because the god, of the, the, god, the god of the Bible was a being born from darkness. Whereas Adam of light or humanity is from the spiritual uh, realm of divine light. Now, so the Adam of light appeared on the first day. He remained on the earth for about two days. He left the lower forethought in heaven and began to ascend in his light. And immediately darkness came upon the whole world. So when he left, you know, he was on earth for a while. Then when he left earth, darkness descended. Now, when Sophia, who is in the lower heaven, wanted to receive authority from Pistis, she created great luminaries and all the stars and put them in the heaven to shine upon the earth and to perfect chronological signs and seasons and years and months and days and nights and seconds and so on. And thus everything up in the sky was ordered. So they're still talking about creation here. 
And so you're having Sophia uh, creating the lights and the, st the stars in the sky. Now, when Adam of light wanted to enter his light, that is the eighth heaven, he was unable because of the poverty that had mixed with his light. So this is really interesting here. So the Adam of light, the spiritual human, went to earth. Now, when he was done being on earth for a couple days, he tried to go back to his heaven, which is called the eighth heaven, but he couldn't because his light became sort of tainted from, become, from being in the material realm. And so there was this uh, imperfection born in him. Be, uh, and so he created another realm for himself. See, this is obviously not a normal human being. This is, this is a god. Okay, He created an eternal realm for himself. In that eternal realm, he created six realms and their worlds, six in number, which are seven times better than the heavens of chaos and their worlds. So he created, he, he created eternal worlds and realms that are better than what God and his angels could create, better than their heavens, seven times better, in fact. But all these realms and their worlds exist within the infinite region that is between the eighth and chaos beneath it, and they are reckoned with the world that belongs to the poverty. Um, so uh, now it gets into the creation of humankind. Now, this is really interesting. But before we get into that, I want to jump over real quick to the secret book of John, because the secret book of John is, is similar, but it's a little different. But I think that this will help maybe if some people are new to this, help understand a little bit what's going on here. So reading in the secret book of John, it, the secret book of John is quite long, but we're going to go to the, to the part of the secret book of John that's the sort of the same, uh, same place that we're in on the origin of the world. And it says that Adam was revealed because within him dwelt the shadow of light. His mental abilities were far greater than those of his creators. They had gazed upwards and seen his exalted mental capability. Okay, so now uh, here's what's going on in the secret book of John. So in the secret book of John, you have Yaldabaoth and his archons. Yaldabaoth and his archons create the world, uh, create paradise. And then what they want to do is they want to create a human. And they look up to the heavenly realms, the realm of perfection. And they see sort of like they see that perfect human and they basically try and create a human being modeled on that. Um, and th th there's a lot that goes into this. Uh, Yaldabaoth has some light in him and is tricked by Sophia. Um, I think it was Sophia and, and her luminaries or something like that to give part of his light to Adam. Anyway, long story short, we don't need to get into all, all those details here. The main, the main thing to, to see is, is the same sort of similar thing going on where you have this spiritual Adam that is, is whose abilities are greater than those of, the, of, of God and the Archons. And the host of rulers and demons plotted together. See, they didn't like this. Of course, they didn't like this. So they're like, okay, what are we going to do? We have this being that's more powerful than us. What are we going to do about this? And... It says, uh, they plotted together, they mixed fire and earth and water together with four blazing winds, they melded them together in great turbulence, and Adam was brought into the shadow of death. They intended to make him anew, this time from earth and water, fire and wind, which are matter, darkness, desire, the artificial to uh, spirit. This all became a tomb, a new kind of body. So, in uh, so they they created a trap to ensnare an, a, a body instead of it being a spiritual body out of earth and water and fire and wind. You know all these material, the material elements, and then. Uh, darkness and desire, and this became uh, a tomb, a new kind of body to trap this being in. It says those thieves bound the man in it and chained him in forgetfulness and made him subject to dying. So this is all that, you know, they saw this being that was more powerful than it. They created a trap, created a body, and, tr and, and made it subject to forgetfulness, uh, introduced, you know, the idea of death. And 
Uh, it says his his was the first descent and the first separation. Let the, yet the light filled epinoia was within him, and it will elevate his thinking. So the the idea here is that you have this human entity that is incredibly intelligent, that's divine. Um, as we saw on the origin of the world, it has the power to create heavens and worlds and and all this. So the parallel that we can understand here is that this is sort of where we are at in a symbolic way right now. We are these infinitely powerful beings that have the power to create our own universes. And guess what? You can verify that. You can have proof of that. Every time you go to sleep and dream at night, you create a universe in your mind. You have the power to literally create a universe, and you do so every time you go to sleep and dream at night. Imagine if you could become fully lucid and fully in control of your dream world. Now, uh, we have become ensnared by uh, the, the world. We have been lost in a fog of forgetfulness. We don't remember what we are, where we are, and why we are here. We think that we're just these bodies. But think about it. Think about instinctual animals. Instinctual animals, uh, they're, 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 they're wonderful and they can experience emotions, but they don't have any high degree of concept manipulation. They just go about their day. They don't think about anything. They're just wandering around and doing animal things as they do, being very cute and fluffy or whatever. They're, they're bouncing around doing their thing. Now, when humans develop self-awareness, well, they, they start to question things. Oh, wait, hold on. What's going on here? I'm separate from an, I'm an I, I'm a me. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. We can, we have mental faculties. Um, we can create groups. We can create governments. So do you see how uh, awareness is being elevated? Now we're reaching a new phase in humanity where we're going from self-awareness to all awareness. And the, the highest developed uh, point of all awareness is what we call hyper-awareness. And this is the realization that we are God, that we aren't just these bodies, that we are beings of divine light. We are eternal beings. Now, of course, in our system, in the Neogenian system, these are uh, systems of eternal energy or frequencies that we call Zetas. So we are eternal beings called Zetas that are an infinite collection of frequency patterns and we have the ability to manifest worlds and realities through the manipulation of the sinusoidal patterns within our minds, through projecting them. We can do this. We have the power to do this. But we have for, you know, for, forgotten this being uh, within the realm of, of matter and bodies, which are limiting. That's, that's what bodies and matter do. So that's why our goal right now, our goal is to awaken humanity up to the fact of what we are, where we are, and why we are here. That's why we as Neogenians are the second coming of Christ. Christ, what was the purpose of Christ? To try and get the world to realize that it was divine. What are we trying to do? Trying to get the world to realize that it's divine. Now, of course, I'm being symbolic and archetypal here, but you can understand that uh, humanity is on the cusp of a new transition, a new phase, where it's beginning to realize what it is, and it needs to eat from the tree of knowledge so that it can understand what it is and ultimately partake in the tree of life and realize that it is eternal. So we as humanity are in are, are on the verge of this new stage of awakening. Now, unlike the Gnostics, we don't view matter as evil. The Gnostics viewed matter as evil. We don't do that. We aren't Gnostics. We are Neogenians. Gnosticism is very interesting, and we talk about it a lot on my channel, but we talk about a lot of things on my channel. We aren't Gnostics. We are Neogenians, and Neogenians don't see matter as being evil. Matter is simply our canvas on which to paint our masterpiece. Matter is the clay from which we can form whatever we will. Matter is the substance that we use to create as gods. Gods create, gods transform. And we can create and transform ourselves, our world, our lives, and create a new planet. And ultimately gain access to higher realms and higher domains through developing new mental fac faculties, the ability to tune. We can start to see the ability to tune begin to develop in humanity in very deep meditative states or psychedelic experiences like DMT, etc. Uh, we don't know, most likely. Uh, remember, don't do anything dangerous or illegal. Now, um, 
but 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 going back to here for a moment, it says, uh, the rulers took the man and put him into paradise, and they told him to eat freely. So in this version, in the secret book of John, uh, paradise. So in in on the origin of the world, uh, paradise isn't necessarily evil, and it's it's created by eros and psyche, and in in this and and. Uh, you know there are different elements like the birds and the bee and, and and the and the beasts, birds and the bees, the birds and the beasts and all that uh, were created by the authorities. But anyway, in here, um, uh, paradise you know paradise is a lot more nefarious. It's it's it is a trap, and it says they told them to eat freely, but their food is. Their food is bitter, their beauty is corrupt, their food is deceit, their trees are ungodliness, their fruit is poison, their prom promise is death. And they place the tree of their life in the middle of paradise. Um, and uh, the, 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 so, so in this version, the tree of life is actually the tree of their life and it's evil. It says, I will teach you the secret of their life, the plan that they made together about an artificial spirit. Its root is bitter. Its branches are dead. Its shadow is hatred. Its leaves are deception. The nectar of wickedness is in its blossoms. Its fruit is death. Its seed is desire. It flowers in the darkness. Those who eat from it are denizens of Hades. Darkness is their resting place. So for... In this version, the tree of life is what keeps humanity ensnared to, it's the tree of their life. So like the tree of material life, it keeps one um, in a state that is uh, bound to matter. And now it says, as for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it is the epinoia of the light. So now we, this is again similar, the epinoia of the light. Epinoia means purposeful thinking. So you can think of it as like intuition or even self-awareness. It's purposeful thought. And so uh, the tree of knowledge of good, and idea, uh, of good and evil is the epinoia of the light. It contains purposeful thinking. It contains intuition. It, contain, it contains higher, it's not desire and darkness and wickedness and, and whatnot. It's higher thinking. And... It says, they commanded him not to eat from it, standing in front to conceal it, for fear that he might look upwards to the fullness and know the nakedness of his indecency. However, I caused them to eat. And this is Jesus Christ speaking. And so in uh, the Gnostic story in the secret book of John, it's Jesus Christ that causes them to eat from the tree of knowledge, which is representative of the Gnostic view of Christ, not as being a savior or someone that you need to worship for forgiveness of sin, but rather someone who uh, helps you understand yourself, helps you look within. And so that's what this is symbolic for saying where uh, Christ ha caused them to eat. And so this is sort of uh, what we are doing here is offering the fruit of knowledge to humanity. With every catalyst we create, with every video we create, every blog post, every article, every short or whatever, every all the information that we're putting out there is offering the fruit of knowledge for humanity to, to eat. Because if they engage with our material, they will begin to realize what they are, where they are, why they are here. They'll go, oh... That wait a minute, what is this place? Where am I? I'm, I'm, I'm not just a body. I'm so much more. So, like uh, the Gnostic tale, this is now our role in um, the current age in going from the shift from self awareness to all awareness. So really have that in mind when you when you know when you create neogenian content when you create videos when you create blog posts etc it's 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 so much more than that it is offering the light of knowledge to humanity so that we can finally reach a higher level of understanding and we can finally create a planetary civilization and we can step away from all this war and fighting and bloodshed and hatred and create a united world reflective of knowing that we are divine where we can finally know that we are divine. What is it when you eat from the tree of knowledge, you realize that 
you are God, you become like God. And then we can create a world that reflects that where we're not fighting each other, be arguing over ridiculous inane concepts, but our focus would be rather on building each other up and empowering each other and increasing the quality of life. This is the world that we can create. Instead of arguing about all the atrocities and bullshit that goes on in the world, imagine instead the problems we would face would be, oh, well, what's the best way that we can increase the quality of life? Instead of being like, oh, wow, you know, should we go to war here? Or should we, you know, oh, wow, all these people are dying over here. What are we going to do about, you know, all, instead of all these horrible uh terrible things that we have to focus on our focus instead would be on oh well well which option is the best which which what thing should we go with that would increase the quality of life the most and that's why in our system we want to create a teleocratic world because in a teleocratic world telos comes from it comes from the greek word telos which means purpose it's a purposeful world so in a teleocracy it's a purposeful world geared toward increasing the quality of life of every individual and the collective so when we take a look at this material here, okay, um, we can see that it's all about the forces of knowledge versus the forces of ignorance. And that is reflective right here and right now. And this is why even though this information was written in, uh, many, 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 you know, centuries and thousands of years ago, depending on, um, uh, you know, what, depending on what material you're looking at these stories are still absolutely 100% relevant right now because we're battling between the forces of ignorance and the forces of knowledge. And we need to be able to uh, get past the darkness that has clouded humanity's vision for thousands of years. And we need to see past that and begin to understand our interconnectedness. And this is why these stories are important because they reflect a very real archetypal battle that's going on right now. The forces of darkness and ignorance versus the forces of knowledge, love, light, reason, etc. Now, remember, we aren't a dualistic system. We recognize that all of us have love and uh, darkness within ourselves. We all have light and darkness, and we need to be able to uh, accept and acknowledge our shadow self. So it's not, I definitely don't want to give that impression, but the battle between ignorance and knowledge is one that's going on every single day. And this is what, you know, you can, you can just, just look around you. I mean, come on, it, it's, it's humanity is mired in ignorance. So it's time for us to move past this uh, dark age and finally start to live. We haven't lived yet. Have you realized that? Humanity hasn't lived yet. We've been surviving, not living. We haven't even started living yet. We've been surviving. It's time to stop surviving and time to finally start really living. So what we're going to do next week is uh, next week we'll probably continue this because there's a lot more to go on and it starts to talk more about how um, humanity is more powerful than Yaldabaoth and Eve starts getting introduced to the story. And it's very cool. Um, Eve plays a very important role, uh, in this story. That's, that's completely different from what you've heard in the Bible. So we're going to be exploring this, you know, sort of secret story of Eve next week, but I hope you enjoyed that, my friends. And remember, if you did, please leave a like, subscribe, all that stuff helps spread this information around. And as always, if you enjoy my work, consider supporting on Patreon. It helps out a lot. Uh, you get access to our weekly members, all our members only videos, and there's a new one every single week. So you can get that by supporting at any tier on Patreon or tier two or higher on YouTube by hitting the join button right below this video. But as always, remember, never feel pressured to support monetarily. You don't have to only do so if you feel good about it, if you feel, if you feel happy about it and you want to do it. Um, otherwise there are plenty of free ways to support like liking and subscribing. That being said, I want to shout out uh, those who support. I appreciate it very much. Thank you to Renaissance Fairy, Cassidy, Angela, the Halloween mom, DB, Enki, New Selena, Paul Rogers, the third, Eric fire, Masam, Ryan, Christopher, and everyone else. Thank you very much.